Hello, this is Dr. Carla Blola, and today we're going to discuss occupational and environmental toxicology. This is part of the many competencies that you need to learn under pharmacology and toxicology. Our topics in basic and clinical toxicology will be divided in two parts. The first part is your occupational and environmental toxicology we will be discussing today. And then the next lecture will be about heavy metals. Let's do a little bit of history. As a bitter cold snap, grip London late in 1952, its inhabitants used unusually large quantities of coal to heat their homes. Soot poured out of their chimneys, mixing with factory and power plant emissions to form an acrid smelly fog that hovered over the city from December 5 to December 9. Trapped in by a high-pressure weather system, as well as the lack of wind, this toxic stew reduced visibility to near zero. Abandoned cars dotted the roads, movie theaters closed because no one could see the screen, and some people even accidentally stumbled into the Thames River. Worst of all, about 4,000 people died of respiratory ailments over the few days you know, from December 5 to December 9. And up to 8,000 more would succumb in the months that followed. So another important historical event in toxicology is your Minimata disease. In the early 1950s, the residents of Minimata, a small co coastal city in southern Japan, began observing some startling animal behavior from cats to uh, birds to dogs. And soon enough, humans too were suffering from what became known as your Minimata disease. Patients started developing slurring of their speech, stumbling, tremors, having trouble with simple tasks and cognitions. And in 1959, the culprit finally emerged. It was determined that the chemical company Chiso Corporation, one of the Minimata's biggest employers, was dumping mercury into the sea as, parts of, as part of its manufacturing process. And that this toxin was poisoning people and animals who ate the local seafood. Chiso continued releasing mercury-tainted wastewater until 1968, reporting at least 2,000 deaths as well as birth defects, paralysis, and other diseases. The last that I'm going to show you is one of the most famous events in toxicology, you know, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. In 1986, on April 26, a turbine test on one of the reactors at the Chernobyl nuclear power station went wrong, leading to a series of explosions that spewed massive amounts of radioactive material into the atmosphere. The accident, which the Soviet authorities attempted to cover up initially, claimed only 31 lives. Two plant workers who died in the blast a third who reportedly killed over a heart attack and 28 first responders who contracted acute radiation syndrome during the frantic early stages of the cleanup. However, Chernobyl also unleashed a thyroid cancer epidemic and likely caused additional cancer cases as well. In 2005, a United Nations back panel calculated that the eventual toll, death toll is up to 4,000, where our other organizations put this number significantly higher. For perhaps centuries to come, an exclusion zone set up around the plant following the forced evacuations of tens of thousands of area residents will be off limits to human habitation. As you can see, Toxicology plays a very crucial role in the healthcare system of not only of an individual, but a community and a nation. That's why it's very important that you learn these. But before we continue, there are many generalities that I want you to know about toxicology, environmental and occupational. Exposure to chemicals may be through the environment, air, water, soil, food, and of course, occupational. Most common chemicals are those used in households, personal care, consumer products, 
and those used in agriculture and industry today. These are there are various effects of chemicals depending on the dose, duration of exposure, and vulnerability of the individuals. It may affect the different organ systems, such as your CNS or central nervous system, effects on the liver and kidneys, reproductive system, the endocrine, among many other systems. Signs and symptoms for acute chemical poisoning of chemicals may be very nonspecific and may manifest initially as headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, irritation of the skins, of the skin, eyes, mucous membrane. Today, in the Philippines, occupational medicine specialists and toxicologists handle individual cases for this one. Treatment is available, but most So let's do a little review of what is occupational toxicology. When we say occupational, it means work. So in this area of toxicology, we deal with chemicals found in the workplace where workers are exposed. Occupational toxicology and occupational medicine specialists are responsible for the following identification of the agents no, or the hazards, acute and chronic diseases uh, that it gives, no? conditions that warrant the use of these agents safely, preventive measures and policies that we can institute, treatment of this disease, and of course, follow-up and surveillance for all those workers exposed to the agents. This was set into law when I, in RA11058. No? You can read that uh, in, over the internet. And this set occupational safety and health standards for the Philippines. The next branch of toxicology is environmental toxicology. It deals with chemicals or pollutants found in the environment that has detrimental effects on living organisms. The signal occurrence in animals no, are important as early warning for impending human events, like what happened with your Minimata disease. And then after that, after that exposure to animals, we can see human effects after. No? So we study the effects of these pollutants in the air, soil, and water. Uh, most of these are products of industrialization, technological development, and urbanization. So let's define hazard and risk. You know, most people are confused between the two. And you need to know the difference uh, between them. No? A, ha a hazard, uh, in the most simplest term, it is something that can potentially cause harm, no? So it's an agent, whether it's a physical, chemical agent, no? That can cause injury disease in a given situation or setting. The risk, on the other hand, is a product of the hazard and the exposure of the individual. So it's the expected frequency of the occurrence of an undesirable effect arising from exposure to a hazard or a chemical or a physical agent. So in other books, it is defined as a likelihood that the hazard will cause harm. So let's identify the hazard and the risk in this picture. No? So this man is trying to cause a highway. And what do you think is the hazard here? So the hazard in this picture are probably the cars, no, the agent that may put cause potential harm. And the risk command is the likelihood of harm taking place. So when this man causes the highway, the risk of an accident is high. When the man is crossing a country road, the risk of an accident is low. So you need to differentiate and delineate that too very well, okay? So let's help me identify what is the hazard and what are the risks no, for this photo. So there's a, a scorching hot sun. There's two men in the beach under the scorching hot sun. The sun poses a hazard for the two. No? It only becomes a risk when we are exposed for it for a long period of time. And therefore, the risk is a product of those and exposure. The risk of harm, the harm that this may cause, is the 
is the likelihood that these patients may develop skin cancers, skin diseases under the sun. So in the workplace or in the occupational toxicology or in the industry, the common routes are inhalational and transdermal route. No? They're very common. Uh, however, um, oral, they still happen, but not as common as inhalational and transdermal. Uh, usually, the common cases of oral are your mix up no, with some bottles. Sometimes they are placed in mineral water bottles. Yung pala, Clorox pala, no? So, sometimes those are the cases. And the uh, environmental, because of bioaccumulation, no? Uh, Water and soil pollutants are absorbed usually in through inhalational ingestion and transdermal. Now, all of them are common. Exposure to a toxic substance that is absorbed by the target human or animal results in a dose of the chemical or toxic substance. Quantity, duration, intensity plays a very important role for these patients, no? Acute exposure, those are single exposure or multiple exposure over a brief period of time, like cases of accidental discharges. Uh, chronic exposure, these are single or multiple exposure over a longer period of time, depending on the chemical. And most common cases are secondary to repetitive handling of chemicals. Please take note that intense, rapidly absorbed acute doses of substances that may be detoxified in small amounts can overwhelm the metabolic functions or biotransformative properties of the person and therefore produce serious or fatal toxicity. The same amount, when absorbed slowly, may result to little or no toxicity. So, as you all know, we cannot totally avoid or eliminate these hazards in the workplace, in the homes, and in the environment. That's why we instituted measures, preventive measures, on how to decide whether a hazard can be removed. And if it cannot be removed, what can we do to limit exposure? So this is what we call hierarchy of controls. The topmost are the most effective control measures and the least effective are your lowest no so above is elimination of course when you eliminate an agent physically uh, that's the most effective no so in elimination we physically remove the hazard if this cannot be eliminated we can start substitute are there other agents that we can use to replace the hazard no if not we do engineering controls. So in engineering controls, we build uh, ways to isolate people from the hazards by introducing you know, walls, um, thick walls for uh, nuclear materials, you know, um, machines that we can use you know, to carry some toxic substances instead of humans. You know. Uh, if engineering controls are now instituted but remains to be limited, we can now do administrative control. Basically, when we talk about administrative control, these are policies no, in the workplace or in the environment that we can utilize so that we limit. No? Uh, here, we change the behavior of people who work around these chemicals or substances. No? And of course, after instituting this three or four, uh, we go to personal protective equipment. That's the only time we use personal protective equipment. No, So this one, we protect the worker from exposure to the agents. No, So we provide suits, hazmat suits, no? masks, if there are respiratory hazards. No, So this is what we call hierarchy of controls. You can apply this in your homes, workplace, and the environment. As well. So now let's go to the specifics. Let's discuss air pollutants. Air pollutants are in the form of vapors, aerosols, smokes, particulates, and individual chemicals. 92% of 
of these major substances account for all of the air pollutants that we experience today. 52% of those are carbon monoxide, 14% are sulfur oxides, 14, another 14% is hydrocarbons, and another 14% is nitrogen products. And the last 4% are your ozone and ozone derivatives. The first air pollutant that we're going to discuss are your carbon monoxide. It's a colorless, tasteless, odorless, and non-irritating gas. It is a byproduct of incomplete combustion, and the common sources are unvented kerosene and gas, gas based heaters, leaking chimneys, furnaces, backdrafting from furnaces, gas water heaters, wood stoves, fireplaces, gas stoves, generators, and other gasoline powered equipment. Automobile exhaust, no? Well, it's the most famous no, source of carbon monoxide, especially from attached garages no, and tobacco smoking. It's easily inhaled and absorbed through the lungs. Exposure may be acute or chronic, and it has been proven that this has teratogenic potential. So you probably heard of this carbon monoxide poisoning inside the car. Some patients are brought to the hospital, no? almost dead because of carbon monoxide poisoning. How does it happen in the car? The internal combustion engine produces a lot of toxic gases which is disposed of through the exhaust system of the vehicle. The most common way of carbon monoxide poisoning is when the, when the car's air consistent is on and it is parked in a garage or space with very limited air movement. The car's intake pulls in the air which is mixed with the exhaust gases. The carbon monoxide, remember, is odorless and colorless. Therefore, it goes undetect undetected by the humans and slowly kills the occupants of the car. So this is another case of carbon monoxide poisoning in the car. Now, people leave the car on, so the heater is on, the couple or the people inside are trapped in the car during a snowstorm overnight. They won't feel it. They won't uh, smell it until they start developing symptoms. No, So at the biochemical level, what happens now, yeah, to these patients? So this again is a graphic representation of sources of carbon monoxide inside a home. No? So as much as possible, you avoid these things, you know, or you maintain them very well. Like for example, cars left running in attached garages, no? So that's a no-no. Clogged chimneys, of course, that's a problem here in the Philippines. Corroded or disconnected water heater, vent pipe, no? You should always maintain your water heater. Dust or wood-burning fireplaces. Cracked or loose furnace exchanger. Uh, improperly installed kitchen range or vent, operating a grill indoors or in garage, and portable kerosene or gas heaters. So what is the mechanism of action for this? No? So as you all know, the hemoglobin carries oxygen no, from the lungs to the tissues. What happens is the oxygen binding site of this hemoglobin gets mixed up with carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide sites blindly but uh, reversibly with the with those sites therefore these rbc's or hemoglobins are not available for binding any more of oxygen no eventually as it continues no more hemoglobin are available for oxygen exchange no so the product formed with this reaction is called carboxy hemoglobin Carbon monoxide has affinity of about 220 times that of oxygen in those binding sites. You see how tight it is, almost irreversible. But it's, it is reversible. That's a common misconception here. It's reversible, but it only bindly, tight, tightly binds. No? So the reduced oxygen transfer to the tissues is the deleterious effect of this it's almost it almost affects uh almost all organs are affected and usually 
the first ones are the highest oxygen demand organs like your brain, heart, and kidneys. So this one is the graphic representation of that mechanism of action. So to your left is an hemoglobin with attached oxygen no molecules in the in their oxygen binding sites. No? And upon introduction of carbon monoxide in the body, it uh, the carbon monoxide binds very tightly to the hemoglobin. And therefore, oxygen and carbon dioxide can no longer be carried in and out of the body. So that's a very important concept here in carbon monoxide poisoning. And after this, you can deduce what kind of symptoms do you expect no, from low oxygen in the So the clinical effects of this you know, carbon monoxide poisoning it depends on the dose and exposure to the carbon monoxide. So initially, they develop symptoms of hypoxia. It usually starts with psychomotor impairment, you know, headache and tightness in the temporal area to be followed by confusion, loss of visual acuity. After this, patients start to develop tachycardia, tachypnea as compensatory mechanisms for the lack of the oxygen, and then syncope, hinihimatay, and eventually coma. And then finally, when this agent is not removed, patients develop deep coma, convulsions, shock, and respiratory failure, and even death. So the clinical effects are aggravated by many things, including heavy labor, high altitude. Remember, when in high altitude areas, there's thinner oxygen content. High ambient temperature does not help as well, no? Smoking, exposure, of course, and cardiorespiratory diseases present in the patient. What is the treatment for this carbon monoxide poisoning? No? The first step, of course, is to remove the patient from the source. No, immediately, once found out. Oxygen is the specific antagonist for carbon monoxide. So if we give patients oxygen, no, whether hyperbaric or high concentrations, but uh, continuous therapy with oxygen. However, high concentrations of oxygen for a short amount of time only because high concentrations have deleterious effect. No? We also employ hypothermic therapy, pinabababa temperature, in patient. Neuropsychological and motor dysfunction, however, persists for a long time after treatment. No, some patients may uh, present with stroke-like features no, because of this event. Now let's go to sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is a colorless irritant gas. It is generated primarily by the combustion of sulfur-containing fossil Fuel. The principal sources of urban sulfur dioxide is the burning of coal, domestic heating, high sulfur transportation, and coal-fired power plants. So what is the mechanism of action? Basically, this is a severe irritant to mucous membranes. Because of its high solubility, when sulfur dioxide contacts moist membranes, it transiently forms sulfurous Acid. And this sulfurous acid, again, is a severe irritant on the eyes, mucous membrane, respiratory tract, and the skin. 90% of inhaled form is absorbed in the upper respiratory tract infection, causing what you call an acute irritant asthma. No? The phenomenon of adapting to these irritating concentrations has been reported in workers. However, evidence remains to be limited. So patients develop signs and symptoms of eye, nose, and throat irritation, reflex bronchoconstriction, and increased bronchial secretion. And patients may develop or exacerbate their bronchial asthma. Patients eventually will develop delayed onset pulmonary edema as well. However, treatment for this is only supportive and there's no specific antidote for sulfur dioxide. So supportive meaning we just give what the patient needs, no, based on the symptoms, signs, 
and clinical labora clinical and laboratory findings of the patient. So the next are your nitrogen oxide or NO2. Don't confuse this with your nitric oxide or NO. Nitric oxide plays a very important role as a vasodilator in the body naturally and even as a drug. Nitrogen oxide, however, is a brownish irritant gas associated with fires and usually those exposed are your farmers to fresh silage and miners exposed to diesel equipment. Today, the common causes are automobile and truck traffic emissions. So nitric oxide, it is a relatively insoluble deep lung irritant. Therefore, via inhalation, it is absorbed and damages the lung infrastructure that produces the surfactant necessary to allow smooth and low effort lung alveolar expansion. No, surfactant is a fluid inside your lung. It is associated with silopillars disease, but you'd see this rarely now, no? Non-allergic asthma and twitchy airway disease. In the acute form, these patients develop irritation of eyes and nose, cough, mucoid, or frothy sputum production, dyspnea, and chest pain, pulmonary edema, fibrotic destruction of perineal bronchioles are the common pathophysiologies, chronic, Patients start developing emphysematous changes. The treatment again is supportive and non-specific. Ozone and other oxides are bluish irritant gas naturally found in the Earth's atmosphere. Produced primarily when the fossil fuel are burned or when some chemicals evaporate. Usually the source for us is that those that are emitted in power plants, motor vehicles, and other sources of high heat compounds. Ozone in the workplace is generally by high voltage electrical equipment and around ozone producing devices like air and water purification systems. Ozone is also found in agriculture. Mechanism of action of ozone, it's an irritant of mucous membranes. It produces upper respiratory tract irritation up to deep lung irritation as well with pulmonary edema. It is also associated with the formation of reactive free radicals. Patients develop shallow rapid breathing and decrease in the pulmonary Compliance. When you say pulmonary compliance, the ability of the lungs to expand and flatten during inhalation and exhalation. No? So it is decreased. Acute, uh, it's irritation, dryness to throat, changes to visual acuity, substrenal pain, and dyspnea, and sometimes acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. In the chronic phase, patients develop emphysematous changes like chronic bronchitis and bronchiolitis. The treatment again is supportive and non-specific. Next, let's go to solvents. Some can be found in your household, some in the industry or the workplace, and some in the environment as well. The solvents that we are discussing are divided into two groups, the halogenated aliphatic hydrocarbons, and the aromatic hydrocarbons. So the first group of uh, solvents that we're going to discuss are halogenated aliphatic hydrocarbons, also called as halohydrocarbons. It's once found in industrial solvents, degreasing agents, and cleaning agents. It is divided into five groups, are carbon tetrachloride, trichloroethylene, chloroform, tetrachloroethylene, and 111 trichloroethane. Most are classified as known or probable human carcinogens, are therefore car some of them are already removed from the workplace, like your carbon, tetrachloride, and trichloroethylene. However, trichloroethylene and carbon tetrachloride remains to be in use as dry cleaning agents and solvent degreasing agents. Freon, a fluorinated aliphatic cause severe damage in the ozone layer in the troposphere. That's one of the reasons why it's already limited or banned 
to be used in other countries. No? The good news is that new air conditioning systems made since 2010 no longer rely on Freon. Most newer air conditioning units are now using a refrigerant called R410A or Puron. This chemical is a hydrofluorocarbon, but has been shown not to harm the ozone layer. Since 2015, has become the standard for residential air conditioning. So by 2020, this year, we expect that the, the Freon will now be totally banned. So old air conditioning units will now we will not be able to maintain them anymore. No? So we have to replace our aircon now. So what are the clinical effects of these halogenated aliphatic hydrocarbons? They are known or probable human carcinogens as mentioned. Some of them are associated with venal, prostate, and testicular cancer. Also associated with CNS depression, kidney injury, liver injury, cardiotoxicity, to a certain extent, like arrhythmia. Chronic exposure in the workplace may, Im may impair memory and produce peripheral neuropathy. The treatment is again supportive and nonspecific. The next class of solvents that we're going to discuss are aromatic hydrocarbons, or benzene, toluene, and xylene. So one of the most used industrial chemicals in the world is benzene, found in gasoline. It is used for its solvent properties. Initially, patients develop CNS depression, nausea, and at a certain dose, euphoria, locomotor problems, and coma. Some patients also report vertigo, drowsiness, and headache. The chronic exposure is due to the fact that this benzene targets pluripotent bone marrow stem cells, therefore causing injury in the long run. Patients start developing aplastic anemia, leukopenia, pancytopenia, and thrombocytopenia. And this is a pluripotent clastogen as well. When we say clastogen, it is a mutagen that acts by causing chromosomal breakage. The treatment for this is supportive and non-specific. So the next is your toluene, also known as methyl benzene, a derivative of benzene. It is found in your paint thinners, nail polish removers, glues, correction fluids, and explosives. Unlike benzene, it has no myelotoxic properties. However, at the acute phase, patients develop CNS depression, skin and eye irritation, and it has proven to be phytotoxic and has teratogenic effect. It is also associated with rapid loss. Of consciousness no? when given in a large dose, severe fatigue and ataxia. So the next is silene, also known as dimethyl benzene. It's a colorless, sweet smelling agent. It is a substitute for benzene in solvent decreasing operations. Like your toluene, it has no myelotoxic properties. However, again, it is also a CNS depressant and a skin irritant. Now, let's go to pesticides. We're going to be focusing on three, organochlorine, organophosphorus, and carbamate pesticides. Organochlorine pesticides are aryls, carbocyclic, or heterocyclic compounds with chlorine substituents. There are four known classes of this, or DDT, or chlorpenotane, already, discontinued benzene, hexachloride, cyclodienes, and toxaphenes. All of these are largely abandoned due to severe environmental damages. They are also, also known endocrine disruptors in humans and animal models. DDT remains to be in use in Africa for domestic mosquito elimination, especially in malaria-infested regions. No? However, the use of this is very effective but is being contested. No? Long-term effects of these are poorly understood. They
Here are the organochlorine pesticides. Their chemical class and compounds belonging to those classes. As you've recalled in the previous slides, organophosphates are already discontinued in use because based on environmental studies, they persist no, in the environment because they are very slow to degrade. So, therefore, bioaccumulation happens. No? And what is the concept of bioaccumulation? So, organochlorine pesticides no, persist in air, water, and soil sediment. And therefore, in the air, it can be transported and then back to the soil and it will leach back into the groundwater. Adding insult to injury is the volatilization from water and then the rain, no? And therefore, they are discharged through flow, flow networks and back to the, to the fishes of the sea. And then the biota, whether they are land or in the sea or in the water, takes up these organochlorine pesticides and they continue to persist in nature and environment and back to us humans. So, this idea of bioaccumulation and persistence in nature uh, made us decide that to discontinue the use of those pesticides. So, the mechanism of action of and clinical effects of organochlorines uh, is they interfere with the inactivation of the sodium channels in excitable membranes and therefore causing rapid repetitive firing in most neurons. Also, calcium ion transport is inhibited. These functions, uh, mechanism of actions, are responsible for the first or in the many of the manifestations of your DDTs and other related drugs, which is tremor. Also, it has carcinogenic potential, but long-term studies are required to establish this. This is an important concept that you have to know. The electrophysiology of neurons is determined in the presynaptic cells and the postsynaptic cells. Presynaptic cells must depolarize no? to release acetylcholine to interact with postsynaptic cells. Once this is achieved, repolarization of presynaptic cells must occur so that acetylcholine release discontinues. However, DDT inhibits sodium channels and to a certain extent, calcium channels, preventing repolarization of presynaptic cells. Therefore, acetylcholine continues to be released, causing continued repetitive firing in the neuron. They are more excitable. So we don't want this. So patients who are exposed to DDT, their initial manifestation is tremor because of this principle. Organophosphorus pesticides are used against a large variety of pests. No? They are either via direct contact or via plant systemics. These chemicals are based on warfare chemicals like Sarin, Soman, and Tabune. They are easily absorbed by the skin, respiratory, and the GI tract. In the environment, it is not considered a persistent pesticide unlike the previous chemicals that I've shown you. So the mechanism of action of these pesticides, they inhibit acetylcholinesterase found in the synapses through phosphorylation of the esteratic sites. So when acetylcholinesterase is inhibited, patients develop symptoms uh, of meiosis, urination, diarrhea, diaphoresis, lacrimation, excitation of the central nervous system, and salivation. Again, products of rapid repetitive firing because there's no acetylcholinesterase. I will show you how this affects, no, in the how this happens in the synapses. So if not reversed, patients will develop neuromuscular transmission failure, rest cardiorespiratory failure, weakness of the respiratory muscles, and eventually death. The specific treatment and are and useful antagonists are available, like your fisostigmine and pralidocimin. Let me orient you first. The green box 
is the normal occurrence at your presynaptic synapse and the postsynaptic neuron. No? This is the acetylcholine signaling at the synapse. The yellow is that after the release of acetylcholine, normally acetylcholine esterases appear at the synapse to stop the signaling process no? because we don't want it to continue. And then when you introduce a drug like your organophosphates or pesticide, they inhibit acetylcholine esterases and therefore the continuous release of acetylcholine and their attachment to the postsynaptic neurons continues indefinitely. You know? Organophosphates are anti-esterase insecticides and exert their acute effects by causing overstimulation at the cholinergic nerve terminals. This process occurs in both insects and humans. Normally, acetylcholinesterase catalyzes the degradation of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the synapse are as represented by the yellow panel. Organophosphate pesticides phosphorylate acetylcholine, thereby reducing the ability of the enzymes to break down the neurotransmitter. This produces an accumulation of acetylcholine in the central and peripheral nervous systems, resulting in acute cholinergic syndrome via continuous neurotransmission. The clinical onset of cholinergic overstimulation can vary from almost instantaneous to several hours after exposure. This is a list showing you the different organophosphorus pesticides. The most famous are melation and parathions and their derivatives. They're Carbamate pesticides, they inhibit again acetylcholinesterase, like your previous pesticides. However, they are done by carbamylation of the esteratic site. They share toxic properties with organophosphorus because of this mechanism of action. However, the difference is that the binding is relatively weak and dissociation occurs after minutes to hours. Of course, even then, patients still de develop symptoms no treatment or similar clinical approach to organophosphates however probably dixomin is not recommended for these cases this is your carbamate pesticides list so there, these are examples of pels or permissible exposure limit values of subcommon air pollutants and solvents in parts per million Next are your environmental pollutants. So in environmental pollutants, we're going to discuss four items, polychlorinated and polypromenated biphenyls, perfluorinated compounds, endocrine disruptors, and asbestos. Polychlorinated and polypromenated biphenyls are highly halogenated biphenyl compounds. They're used for insulation and fire retardancy. Most production resulted in enormous environmental problems. It is very toxic and now banned for use. Wood is the major source of PCV residues in humans. Potent endocrine disruptors as well, and they are very highly likely to produce teratogenic effects in animal studies and reproductive problems as well. They persist in the environment. Perfluorinated compounds are used as coolant materials in air conditioning systems, used as oxygen carrying materials in clinical studies, and used as heat, stain, and stick resistant coatings for cookware fabrics and other materials like Teflon. You know? It had deleterious effect in the ozone layer of the atmosphere and it is considered a persistent environmental chemical, limiting their use. Now, these perfluorinated compounds are actually banned you know? so because of their impact in the bio systems. Humans absorb this by ingestion and inhalation because remember this is persistent in the biosystems. 
human half-life is usually three years when absorbed, it is a potent endocrine disruptor. Long-term adverse effect on reproduction function, cellular perversion, and other cellular homeostatic mechanisms have been fully established. It is associated with the proliferation of breast cancer cells, renal cancer cells, ovarian and prostate, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is also associated with cholesterol and uric acid abnormalities. It is uh, also associated with what you call a polymer fume fever. The cadmium vaporizes in welders, no? and then they develop respiratory distress fever malay. Usually, this is self-limiting. Again, this is persistent in the environment. Asbestos, it has been widely used in the industry for over a hundred years. And it has been shown that this asbestos causes what you call asbestosis or a progressive fibrotic lung disease. It can manifest as well as lung cancer and mesothelioma. It has synergistic effect with patients who are, who are exposed to cigarette smoking and exposed to radon daughters. The mechanism for cancer is not well defined, but many countries have already banned this asbestos. Endocrine disruptors. They are mimickers or enhancers or inhibitors of a hormonal action. They usually have estrogen-like or anti-androgenic effects, and some may even affect the thyroid functions. These disruptors include plant constituents like your phytoestrogens and mycoestrogens. Synthetic forms are industrial chemicals, persistent organochlorine agents like DDT, PCBs, and brominated flame retardants. There's an increasing concern mainly because it becomes bioaccumulated. The toxicity profile is very grim and the increasing contamination in the environment because of its persistence. Now we go to the last section, the metals. Please take note that these metals are not your heavy metals. They will be discussed separately in a different lecture. The metals that we're going to discuss are your beryllium, cadmium, and nanometals. They have posed major health problems in the industry, home, and other environments. Occupational exposure and poisoning due to these are relatively new problems in medicine. In 2016, we've discovered that cobalt is also considered a human carcinogen. Again, please take note that heavy metals will be discussed in a different chapter. Beryllium is a light alkaline metal found in ceramics, alloys, computers, dental equipment, devices that require hardening like missile ceramic nose cones and heat shield tiles in space vehicles. Inhalational route is the most common route. It is a known human carcinogen class 1. It causes what you call acute beryllium disease and chronic beryllium disease. It is characterized by progressive pulmonary fibrosis, more so on the chronic phase. Cadmium is a transition metal found in nickel cadmium batteries, pigments, low melting point eutectic materials, in solder, in television phosphors, in plating operation, semiconductors, and plastics. It is inhaled and ingested by workers exposed to this and produces what you call a cadmium fe fume fever. Usually welders presenting with shaking chills, cough fever, and body malay are the most common patients presenting with this. Chronic exposure may lead to progressive pulmonary fibrosis and renal failure. And it is, this one is also a human carcinogen class 1. Nanomaterials. These are any material, natural or manufactured, bearing a size of at least one dimension that lies between 1 to 100 nanometer in size. They play increasing roles in the industry today. They may be gold, silver, cadmium, ceramic, aluminum oxide nanowares, carbon, silicon, germanium nanotubes, zinc oxide nanocrystal, 
gold nano wafers and copper oxide nano cubes. The toxicology profile is fairly new and novel, and the increasing production led to environmental contamination. The toxicology profile of these nanomaterials, based on assumption, may be the same as your large metals or maybe different as well. Nanomaterials are usually taken up by inhalation, oral, dermal, and parenteral. The assumed toxicity may be both similar and different, as mentioned, from the larger bulk or bulk materials. They can cause the cellular membrane and penetrate nuclear material and genetic information. Some established nanomaterial side effects are your inosilica silica kidney toxicity, for zinc oxide hepatocellular damage, multi-walled carbon nanotube are very cytotoxic in humans, titanium dioxide, the one found in sunscreens and sunblocks, are toxic to lungs and other organs when ingested. These are your known nanomaterials. So this is the classification system we use for an object, an item, or an agent, whether they have direct carcinogenic effects to humans or not. It's called the IARC classification or International Agency for Research on Cancer Classification. So read on this as well. For the interest of time, please study these terms as well. No? Permissible exposure limits or PELS, threshold limit values or TLDs, acceptable daily intake, what is bioaccumulation, and what does it mean when something persists or one agent persists in the environment. So for questions or concerns, you may reach me at my Twitter account at carlablola and email kcablola at usd.edu.ph. So hopefully you learned a lot today. And my message is that the things that you've learned about toxicology, you can apply in your homes, in your workplace, in anywhere, no? So you can carry it all throughout your practice. So, yun. And also, I leave you this quote, the Hippocratic Oath, no? First, do no harm. Goodbye, class, and I hope you're staying safe every single day.